Again, let me say it is good to see everyone out this evening. Appreciate, Chip, your selection of songs. Each song that he selected pretty much goes with one of the points of the lesson tonight. And I appreciate him taking the thought to do just that. If you have your Bible, let's turn to the book of Psalms. In the 19th Psalm, I want to begin with verse 9 down through verse 11. It says there, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. The Bible for us stands as a testimony to the wisdom and the foreknowledge of God and the predictability about us as we live our life on this earth. There are some ancient warnings in the scripture that apply to modern man. Hence the title of our sermon tonight, Ancient Warnings for Modern Man. The scripture never grows old. It is always relevant to today, and it will be relevant tomorrow, just as it was in the past. While we do not live under the old law, the Old Testament, the principles that are found within its pages serve as a great warning for us today. For if God's word was true in the days of the Israelites and the children of Israel, is it just as much as true for us today as we live the Christian life? I say it is. And so tonight what I want to do is in this lesson is I want to look at three passages of Scripture, three ancient warnings that we should be able to apply to our day in our time. First of all, if you'll turn back to the book of Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 6, we'll read verses 13 down through verse 16. It says, Because from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. All the time I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. And thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see, ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. First of all, an ancient warning for us is to walk in the old path. As we begin reading there in verse 13, the word of the prophet describes the day and the time of the people of Israel. He says that all of them, and notice he says from the prophet to the priest, there is significance in why Jeremiah writes those words. It is to let us know that those whom they would consider to be the leaders, those who passed the message of God to them, he says they were corrupt due to covetousness. They began to be dishonest. And I like, and I've changed this just a hair, they like to use soothing words. Now this morning... I hope you noticed, and someone had asked me to do a sermon with a little fire and brimstone in it. I think I accomplished that goal this morning. But there are so many who don't want fire and brimstone. 
They want smooth and soothing words. They want words to make them feel comfortable in whatever position of life that they are. Brethren, understand something. These folks had no remorse for their sins. They were not a one bit sorry or penitent for the sins that they had committed against God. And so God says there's only one way for you to cure your problem. And that is to walk in the old paths if you want to have true peace, true rest, if you will, for your soul. Think about today. How many people do you know, not in the world, outside of the church. But how many folks do we know within the church that are asking for change, for innovation, for stepping aside from the old paths? We see it constantly in the church. People say, well, we need something different. No. The Lord gives us a warning that if we want to have true peace within our life, we've got to go back to the old past. And as you look at verse 16, in order for you and I to benefit from the old paths, notice he first of all tells us the position that we need to be in. He says that we must stand. And then he goes on and he says that we need to look, we need to see. Brother, whose responsibility is it to gain wisdom and understanding of God's Word? Whose responsibility is it to learn the Word of God? Oh, someone says, well, Brother Ray, that's easy. I can answer that question. That's your job. That is the elder's job. That is the Bible class teacher's job. Well, guess what? You better go back and look at the old paths and see whose responsibility it is to do those things. We are each called individually to search the Scriptures. We're each individually going to be called to give an answer for our own individual person. Look, you've got to see. That's what he's telling the people. But then he goes on. And he says, ask. Ask. Brethren, there are too many people today who are afraid to ask because they're afraid they're going to offend the preacher or the Bible class teacher. They won't ask for the old path. Because they've gotten too comfortable in some of the new paths that are trying to be laid out. You have to have a desire to learn. And then, you know, he goes on in the last part of that verse. And in order for us to benefit from the old paths, we have to walk in the old paths. In other words, if we want the church to grow and to prosper as it did in the first century, what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to go back, Paul, just as the title of our study books on Sunday morning. We've got to go back to the Bible, to the basics. And we have to commit ourselves to that knowledge so that we can pass that knowledge on to others. Number one, the ancient warning is walk in the old way. Point number two, turn over to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33, and let's read the first five verses. The scripture says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people, and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman. When he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, 
Then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself, but he who takes warning will save his life. Maybe we don't understand the principle of what God is telling Ezekiel to tell the people. The people of this day understood what the responsibility of the watchman was. Let me give you an example of who I would consider in the course of American history of who a watchman might be. How many of you have heard of a gentleman named Paul Revere? Y'all heard of him? Has anybody heard of Paul Revere? Perhaps maybe even you remember what Paul Revere did, right? He got on his horse and he rode around and what did he say? The British are coming. The British are coming. He was giving a warning. He was being a watchman for the people. In the days of the folks here, there was one who was set out and they each were given a specific responsibility, a time frame in which they were to watch for the enemy that was coming. And if that watchman failed to give a warning, the watchman would be held responsible. Whoa, wait a minute, brother. The watchman would be held responsible. Let me put it to you this way. Who are the watchmen today? Who is the watchman today? Oh, Brother Ray, that's easy. That's got to be the preacher. That's got to be the elders. That's got to be the Bible class teachers. But I'll give you partial credit. No. Who are the watchmen? Anyone who has put Christ on in baptism has accepted the responsibility of being a watchman. Oh. Brother Ray, are you saying that I am now a watchman? Well, guess what? If you got that right, and you heard me say that, then yes, you are the watchman. You see, the passage here says, if the watchman gave the warning, the warning given, whose choice is it to either heed the warning or disregard the warning? Whose responsibility is it for you and for myself as watchmen to share the gospel? Whose responsibility is it to heed the warning that we put out? It is not my responsibility anymore. It becomes the responsibility of the hearer, the learner, the one you're trying to teach. You see, what we're trying to do, being the watchman, as he blows the trumpet and warns the people, that was his job, that was his responsibility. You see, if you go to the book of Acts, chapter 20, and look at verse 26 and verse 27. Acts chapter 20, look at verse 26 and verse 27. It is in this passage as Paul writes to the elders of the, Ephesians, of the church at Ephesus. He says, Therefore I testify you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Paul says, I have fulfilled the mission that God has assigned to me. He says, I haven't shunned. I haven't backed away from declaring to you the entire message that comes from
from God. So if you have the outline and you see the last, the last statement under that section, it's a very sobering question. What have you done lately to warn people of their impending doom? What have you done lately to share the message of salvation through Jesus Christ to a world that is lost and dying? If you haven't been sharing that message, then you're not blowing the trumpet and warning the people. Point number three. Let's go back to the book of Deuteronomy. And as we go back to the book of Deuteronomy, we're going to begin in verse 10 in chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 10. So shall it be, or so it shall be, when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, houses full of good things which you did not fill, hewn out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him and shall not take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods and the gods, the gods of the peoples whom are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of your, the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Beware, lest you forget the Lord. The context of this passage speaks of independence from God that some feel when life is good. I like what God, did you, did you notice how I emphasized the word you as I read through there? I, ho I hope you noticed that God says, I have already given you all of these things. You have done nothing. But they had to do something. All they had to do was to remember God who brought them out of bondage in the land of Egypt. That's what Moses records for us in Deuteronomy 6. Brethren, understand something. All that we have in this world, it's not ours. I don't care how big your bank account is. I don't care how big your house is. I don't care what type of fine vehicle you drive. It's not yours. Somebody says, Brother Ray, it is mine. I paid for it. Who gave you the ability to work? Who gave you your very being? Brother Ray, I hate it when you make it so simple. That's what somebody would say. Brethren, everything we have is given to us by the hand of God. The Bible says that we are to be stewards of the blessings that we receive from God's hand. So nothing is mine. It is all on loan to me from the God who created me and who, and who has blessed me with the ability to use what he, my mind, to use my hands, to use my feet. 
It is all because God has blessed us that we are able to have things. So all things really belong to God. That's what he's telling these folks. These things don't really, you, you've done nothing. I, 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 I really like the one uh, chip there where it says, you're going to go into houses full of all good things. Boy, how nice it would be to be able to walk into a house that's fully furnished and you didn't have to do anything to get it. Wouldn't that be nice? God says, that's what you're getting. But you didn't do it. We go back and we can look at a lot of different passages of Scripture. Brother, understand something. God is much more than a safety net. God promises what? To give us what we need, not what we want. Brother Jonathan came out this morning after the sermon. And he mentioned about being able to breathe. He said he's thankful that he can breathe because he has asthma. And that hit me. When I said that this morning about, you know, we take that for granted, don't we? God blesses us with what we need, not with what we want. If you go back to verse 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, we understand that God is to be at the very core of our being. Here's the phrase, and the great commandment, as Jesus says in Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Don't Forget who the Lord is and what He has done for you. These three warnings. Seek the old paths. Blow the trumpet and warn the people. And beware lest you forget the Lord. Although they were written in the old law, I personally believe they apply to us today. I believe if we will begin to seek the old paths, how much better off would we be? Not only as a church, not only as the Lord's church, but remember God was writing to a nation. How much better off would we be if we went back to the principles of upon which our country was founded. If we went back to the declaration that all men are created equal, how much better off would we be? How much better off would we be as the church to blow the trumpet, to share the message with a lost and dying world? And brethren, even in the church, we become complacent. And we need to heed the warning not to forget what God has done for us. I'm afraid too many in the church have forgotten how God has truly blessed us. The greatest blessing of all was while we were sinners, Christ died for us. How often do we forget the sacrifice Christ made? And we know that he gave his life so that he could be an atonement for our sin. We know we contact the blood that was the atoning agent in the waters of baptism where we are buried with him, putting to death the old man of sin, coming out of the waters of baptism to walk in a newness of life as a different person. Tonight, if you're here and you haven't done that, heed the warning. Salvation is at your fingertips, but only if you are obedient to the commands of God. Jesus himself says, 
except you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. He also tells us, except we repent, we will what? We will all likewise perish. And then He says in Matthew chapter 10, the one who will confess me before my Father who is the one, I get this backwards every time, the one who will confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. And then he says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Jesus tells us what we must do. That's going back to the old past. That's blowing the trumpet and giving the warning that if one does not obey the gospel, that they will be lost. That's not a hateful message as those in the world portray it. That is a message of love and of concern. And then you come to the last. After we are baptized and our sins are washed away, Oftentimes, we fall right back in to the ways of the world because we forget who God is and what He has done for us. And at that point in time, it's time for us to repent. As the prodigal son did, come to ourselves, go to the Father with a willing heart to say, I have sinned. Repent of those sins, confess those sins. Will you let us pray with you and pray for you? Only you know what your deed is. Our prayers you come while we stand and while we sing.